Hey everyone, this is John Carvello. I am the president of Stono Capital and Divestopedia. Uh, I'm so excited for this topic today. Uh, as always, we have wonderful guests uh, joining us on this topic of mastering uh, acquisition structuring. Uh, we, we've really outdone ourselves with the guests today. So uh, we, we have four amazing panelists that are joining. Uh, we, we do have some technical difficulty here getting a little bit of feedback so maybe he can uh put his phone on mute but i think he can hear us i think he's here um but let me introduce our, our panelists and our guests so we have mark morgenstern who's the author of soul of the deal creative frameworks for selling and investing in any business uh, we have bill snow who's the author of mergers and for dummies uh, and we have kenneth marks author middle market m a and uh, for advisors, investors, and business owners. Guys, thank you so much for joining us here today. My pleasure. Awesome. Yeah. Nice Mark, are you here? I'm just double checking. Can, can you hear me through the computer as opposed to my phone? I can hear you through the computer. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Yeah. Hear Great. Then yeah. I'm going to turn everything else off. Perfect. Super. Okay. So we've Excellent. overcome all technical difficulties and we are all here. Oh. Can you still hear me? Yeah, we can still hear you. I can't hear you. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, we're we're going to try to do this by, um, um, I don't know. I'm going to send Mark yeah, a text right now. Yes, yeah, send, 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 send dial, in, dial in by phone again. Yeah. Okay, perfect. We're trying to fix this on the fly if we can. Be dialing in again, yeah. Yeah, hopefully. Okay, guys. Uh, just a little bit, a little bit of uh, housekeeping here. So for the Q and A, we have the Q and A panel box that everybody can join us on uh, and ask questions. Uh, and then um, we do have uh, the chat box open. So if you guys are, if everybody's on the chat box, uh, maybe just let us know that you're here and you're on the chat box and say hi to our panelists. Uh, and also let us know where you're from. That'd be pretty cool. Awesome. So. Mark, can you hear us? No, doesn't look like Mark can hear us. So we're gonna start with uh, Kenneth here and we're gonna ask Kenneth our first question uh, around deal structuring. So, I mean, this is a good way to frame the deal structuring conversation. Um, Kenneth, you know, what, what are some of the common deal structuring mechanisms that are used in m and transactions? And maybe just give us a brief overview of how they work. Yeah, good. Uh, John, thanks so much. It's great to be here with you guys, with Bill and Mark. And, and I see that we've got a lot of people that have joined. So uh, nice to be here. Um, you know, the way that I tend to think about this, and, and so my my frame of reference is middle market deals. So it tends to be uh, transactions that are going to be a few million up to um, several hundred million. Uh, so this tends to be the world that I operate in. And as you think about that, um, you know, if we deal structure really, and this is kind of a, I think about it as three kind of buckets. Uh, first, there's the economic side of structuring a deal. So what are, what's, what's the valuation, what's being sold uh, and bought, and um, what's the risk associated that, with those, and then how do you, how do you pay for that? So that can be in terms of cash. Uh, if you're paying, in, maybe you're getting rollover equity. Maybe there's an earnout. Maybe th there's other types of mechanisms for for uh, actually thinking about the consideration. The the second is is the legal side, which has to do with are we doing a stock sale or an asset sale? Is it in whole or part? Um, and then th thirdly, I just broadly talking about the, uh, Here, the tax the side. Is okay. you know what what are the tax okay. attributes? Okay. Is it a, you know what what are we? Is it an LLC? Is it a partnership? Is it um, is it treated as an S corp or is it a C corp? Um, so we have to kind of play all three of those together to come up with the right solution and the right structure. Can you hear me, Mark? We Mark, can. Mark, Mark, we can hear you. Hey, whatever you want me to do. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sounds good. Awesome. Uh, Bill, uh, Kenneth, are, are you? You want to add anything to that, or, or you, no? No, that's just in a broad sense. That's kind of the way. It, as is just to kind of kick it off. Um, that's how how I I begin the 
thought process. Yeah, perfect. Bill, do you do you want to add to that? Any other kind of like mechanisms that you know, commonly used? Yeah, well, yeah, well, cash, note, stock, earn out, uh, sometimes employment agreement or consulting agreement that can add a little something else as well when you're putting all these different pieces together. I always liken it to uh, knobs on a uh, amplifier or stereo. You can turn something up a little bit. You can turn something down a little bit. I've done that before with someone we were trying to buy a company and he did the Nigel Tufnell and he turned everything to 11 instead, <laughs> instead of going up and down a little bit. But um, uh, I, I, I agree with, uh, with what Ken said. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned like other agreements in there too, right? Like a lot of people, when they think of deal structuring, they think of like, uh, you know, just the purchase price. How do we structure the purchase price? But there's so many other uh, ancillary agreements in there that can be uh, structured and, and kind of brought into this idea of, of like, uh, you know, r really dodging um, the deal a little bit. Yeah. And so sometimes, John, th th we also think about um, what else is going with the company? For example, is, is there real estate that's potentially going with, uh, is, that, is that on the table? If it's a company that has multi, either single or multiple locations, are they selling the real estate? Are they leasing it? That's another variable that comes into deal structure for sure. Okay, I just uh, want to get Mark in the conversation too. So I just sent a message to see if he can uh, add to this topic. Maybe he still can hear us, but... Um... Okay, guys, let's let's move on to the next question here. So well, this one's for you, and, and, and hopefully we can get Mark in the conversation because uh, I, I really, uh, you know, it's really nice. become one of my favorites. Um, okay, let me... Oh, uh, like he's so like he's dialing in here. Uh, ...of using a, a simple deal structure versus a more complicated deal structure. Um, you know, sure. I, Albert Einstein was the one that said everything should be as simple as possible. Yeah. But yeah. right, so I find I find that people like gravitate to these very complicated deal structures when a simple deal structure work, might work. But maybe you could talk about the pros and cons uh, of using something yeah. which is a little bit more complex. Yeah, yeah, less work. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, the more complicated a, a structure, I, I think, the greater the odds that you'll have some sort of dispute. And especially when you're looking at at earnouts, and, and I'm going through this now with with a negotiation, and uh, a buyer wants to make it based on the bottom line, and that to me is a recipe for dispute because how do you define the bottom line? Are they going to start applying overhead? Are they going to start insisting that uh, certain added expenses are put into the business? And it just it's it's just a the, the intent is good, but I think that the more complicated things can be, the more that you open yourself up for a disagreement and a dispute. And that's the last thing you want. You want a, a deal that's going to be fair for, for both sides. Yeah, no, Bill, or sorry, Ken, do you want to add to that in terms of like just the simplicity of transactions that you've seen versus trying to get something that's really complicated? Yeah, I mean, no, no question, the simpler, in, in many cases, the simpler, the easier. However, that, that becomes, you know, what, what ends up happening is we kind of, I try to take it back to what are the goals of both parties? What are we really, what are the must-haves and what are we trying to accomplish? And then as you think about some of those more complexities, are, are they really worth it? So you sometimes want to really evaluate the, 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 the cost versus um, the gain, if you will, on some of those more complexities. And see if you can, if you can, you know, kind of. Sometimes you can, for example, let's take an earnout, a classic, you know, mechanism that you see in deals. And it earnouts may sound good on paper, but as Bill was just mentioning, you 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 have all kind of issues around mechanisms of how do you measure value, and then you end up with disputes. The world changes over time. The longer the earnout. Many cases, the more difficult, and then, um, and sometimes you can basically you can uh, reach an, a, a point of um, where it's acceptable to both sides to eliminate the earn out. We had this in a case uh, that we just closed on the transaction last month, where at the end of the day, the upside for the earn out and the risk protection for the buyer, the upside for the seller and the the risk protection for the buyer. It, the seller was willing just to take a 
slightly lower price or lower amount. And it's more than for the earnout. Let me, say, for example, if a million dollar earnout, they were willing to take four hundred thousand and not have the earnout at all. And uh, sorry, I was just going to say, if anybody can hear me, I can hear we you. We can hear you. Okay, hey. perfect. Yeah, we can hear you. Hey, Mark is here. Awesome guys. Yeah. Uh, we, we, Kenneth, Kenneth, maybe you finish your sentence and then uh, get get some uh, some comments here from Mark. Yeah, some, sometimes there's just ways to compromise on some of the complexities that allow you to simplify. And it, it, and it comes from being very practical and looking at the risk reward for each element of the deal. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Mark, uh, welcome, number one. And, and so <laughs> grateful that you're here and were able to join us uh, you know, after a little bit of technical difficulty. But we were just chatting about um, you know, the pros and cons of using a simple deal structure versus like a more complicated deal structure. Uh, and both Will and Kenneth talked about, you know, some of the complexities around earnouts uh, and some of the other mechanisms. But uh, what, what do you see as, as um, some of the cons between simple versus complex? Um, and, and, you know, how do you determine what the best, best approach is for a given deal? So not having heard prior 10 minutes, I hope <laughs> I don't talk over anybody. Almost any question that's posed as binary, the answer is yes, because it's always the particular circumstances you're looking at. I have a very strong bias. There's a, an old expression, K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid. I love that I expression. think it should be K-I-S-S-S, -S -S, keep it short and simple, stupid. So part of the complexity versus simplicity is just length. You know, if you are forced to identify, and by the way, that means buyer and seller, what three things do you actually care about? Do you both agree those are the three things or four things or five things? Great. Let's reach 100% agreement on them. If you can reach 100% agreement on them, the structure will reveal itself. But part of that process, which I'm sure everybody already said is, to do that, you actually have to know who you are and what your actual risk tolerance is. And if you know that, then you can also hear your counterparty and learn their risk tolerance. Because all of this is varying degrees of certainty and uncertainty and risk allocation. You can't solve all the problems on day one. Find three you can solve, agree on them, sign a piece of paper that says that, and then get more complicated. And what tends to happen, sorry, I'm gonna, this is my 30 seconds and I can stop talking. <laughs> but the capital markets, which we've all lived many cycles of, are super predictable. You have an event like SVB, the whole world sphincters tighten, Right. Now it's massive uncertainty. Now I try to overstructure everything and I don't want to do anything. That's exactly when you should be doing things. And that's when you've got to make it simpler, not more complex. Because if you try to address every risk that could exist, you've got a thousand page document and no deal. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love, I love that concept of finding three or four kind of hills to die on for each side and, and like addressing those. That's a really good uh, simple way of, of uh, before I move on and, to the next. And, yeah, let me just say at the risk of offending the lawyers out there, Mark, just explain exactly why you don't want a lawyer negotiating a deal. You'll get a thousand pages and no deal closed. <laughs> we get a question coming up on that. So, uh, uh, before I move on to the next question, I do want to put in the chat for everybody. I'm going to put everybody, uh, a link to, um, Bill's, Mark's and Kenneth's books in there. Again, these are incredible books that I think every deal maker uh, needs to uh, have on their bookshelf or in their kind of audio podcasts to, to listen to. So pretty amazing books. Uh, you guys go out and get the books. So uh, Bill, I, I'm, uh, I'll ask you the next question. You know, how do you strike a balance between uh, the need to structure a deal before detailed due diligence is completed? Um, so in other words, how do you mitigate the risk of incomplete information? Uh, while also moving quickly to secure a deal. I kind of touched on that, but can you kind of expand on that a bit? Sure. Am I selling this or buying this? 
you know, let's talk from the both sides. So you are you're buying this. We're we're, we're kind of positioning well, it from the position side. Sure. Uh, valuation first. Let's talk about that as an extremely complicated mathematical formula that largely depends upon what side I'm representing. We have to understand that first of all. Uh, trying to quickly get a deal done. Again, I don't know if I'm buying or selling, and so the the most important thing if when you when you've got a deal, you're working on a letter of intent, it's non-binding, okay? So if I am buying, if I'm representing the buyer, we're buying a company and we're about to go into due diligence, which we've just done on a, on a transaction, we are going to structure something. We're going to rely on the information that's been provided us to us by the seller, or maybe the seller has a representative, uh, investment banker, and they are making representatives or representations. And our job is to confirm those representations. And so to the extent that everything they've told us is accurate, then that's going to be fine. If we start seeing some sort of material change, either the business has diminished or had some sort of problem since we signed the LOI or something has been revealed where the, the financials are not the same or it has a much bigger concentration or whatever the issue is, then that completely throws uh, whatever we've negotiated off the the table. And frankly, it's it's bad pool for, for people to uh, misrepresent something and negotiate. And then when the facts are revealed, something else is revealed. Awesome. Yeah. No, uh, Mark, do you want to, you want to add to that? Do you want to just uh, kind of give a little bit of a framework between, you know, enough information, like you said, uh, there's never going to be enough information, but how do you get enough information uh, to put together a deal structure that might work and then, you know, kind of roll into due diligence after that? Yeah. So, so Bill started with, I think, the right place, which is a letter of intent. And you've got two fundamental choices there. If you're the buyer, if I'm the buyer, I love a two-page letter of intent. It says the purchase price. And then there's a great, to his earlier point, lawyerly paragraph that says, of course, it's subject to all the normal representations, warranties, and indemnifications appropriate for a deal of this size and comparable amount or whatever it says. It basically says nothing, right? The, sell, the seller now sees a purchase price. You have every out in the world. The only piece that you care is binding is that you've got a 60 or 90 day exclusive. Now, if you're the buyer and you've accomplished those two things, you've got the seller planning to retire <laughs> and you have the property off the market for 60 or 90 days. And every day after that, the buyer's position improves, seller's position weakens. That's exactly what he said. The converse, by the way, sure. is yeah. you're the seller. You want the eight-page letter of intent that spells out everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kenneth, what, 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 how, how do you uh, find striking the balance between uh, structuring a deal before detailed due diligence um, and, and this you know, details, uh, lots of details versus less details? Uh, and maybe give the perspective of the buyer and the seller. Yeah, I, th I let me let me argue from the seller side for just a minute. So, you know, if part of it is doing your homework up front as a seller, so that when you go to market, you have good data, and if uh, so that when you get to what Bill was talking about, which is confirmatory due diligence, you're not going to have issues. So the key is to is to is to really have some good prep done. Make sure your numbers are solid. And make sure that um, the critical items um, that are material to a buyer that you've you've shared those, whether it's um, you know a customer concentration, whether it's litigation, whether it's uh, uh, something in the business that's changing, you want to make sure that you've got enough out there that that you can get a while not while these LOIs are not binding legally, which is Mark, what Mark was saying. If you have a strong seller that has options, what you don't want to do is, is you, you don't want to retrade a deal if you can help it. And so you want these things binding in principle. And the strongest negotiation for a seller is at the time of the LOI. Uh, you're not going to get the purchase price to go up typically unless something's really changed during due diligence. And um, so you're, you're trying to basically pr preserve the value you negotiate it once you sign the LOI. Um, and so the thing to do is um, is make sure that there are no surprises that go along with that LOI as the seller. And 
um, you don't want to over promise, but you don't want to shortchange yourself either because every buyer probably discounts what you tell them to some degree and uh, or is at least looking at it with a skeptical eye. So I, I don't know if that's helpful, John, but. Yeah, super there, helpful. I think I think it gives a really good uh, balance from both sides, the buyer and the seller and what they're trying to achieve, um, you know, when they're trying to, you know, get that initial structure in place uh, and that initial kind of like deal parameters in place. Bill, you're going to add something? Yeah, and, and, and these points are all uh, well taken and, and I totally agree with them. You know, one other issue, too, is the tax issue. And that goes back into are you selling or buying assets or stock? This is such a frustrating thing. We deal with this with, with our clients and prospects. And I call it the yeah, yeah, yes, where the business owner calls up their <laughs> tax account. I would think about selling the company. And they get this dismissive wave from the accountant because it sounds like work. You know, who wants to do work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you want to do a stock deal. So I call it the yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not the rock band. And it drives me nuts because at some point they're going to have to sit down and have somebody put pen to paper and look at what is the basis of the stock or the assets, is accounts receivable, going to be treated differently, inventory, all these different permutations. And I see no reason why people can't do it ahead of a sale so that seller can be prepared. And they just refuse to do it. And I, it, I speak to them blue in the face and they just refuse to do it. And it comes back to, to bite them in the keister. I'll tell you one of the things we do, Bill, which um, to get around that is, is when we're when we're leading the sale process, we um, we end up trying to pull together the deal team what we call the deal team um, at the at very outset, which includes who's the tax account, who's the accountant that's going to be, you know, really blessing the tax provisions of the purchase agreement and is going to bless the, the taxation of what we come up with. It's a deal attorney. It's ourselves as the banker, investment banker, and if there's a wealth manager. And so we try to get that nailed down because the tax um it tax is a driver for many, you know, what we care about is after tax proceeds, not purchase price at the end of the day. Right. So right. I, I'm with you, Bill. It's um, I, I, I have I found that a lot of tax structures, though. Yeah. Um, sorry, I was just going to add, ahead, I thought John. a lot of tax structures come in after, you know, kind of a, uh, an LOI is in place, right? So it's almost hard to put a tax structure um, in front of, of kind of a deal structure, uh, Mark, maybe you want to you want to give some. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm I, I I might have a slightly different view. Okay. Because <laughs> what both Bill and Ken said is there is a fundamental difference. Does the seller want to sell assets or stock? I mean that's a pretty big divide, and they're going to be very different tax consequences. So to me, the person who really doesn't want to do that is the seller who doesn't want to pay everybody for their time. And that's True. the real reason they don't want an answer to that question, which is a really Sounds bad like work, approach, right? Yeah, and I totally if you want to make it simple, right? Just say, assume the purchase price is ten dollars. Show me where the cash would flow at ten dollars. Show me the tax consequences. You make it concrete, not abstract. Now they've got a very simple process. Apply it, and then to Bill's point, then you go, or actually Ken's. Whoa, look at the after-tax difference. Who would have guessed? That's a good time to do that, and that is not a hard exercise. I totally agree, and, but it's the, the horse to water. I've been on the phone with accounts, and they refuse, to, well, it's the, they refuse to do the work. And I have the balance sheet. I have to ask questions. Okay, well, if we're doing an asset deal, how is this going to be taxed? And uh, if, if we're selling assets, it looks like we're going to be selling this at, at a loss, less than book value, not a loss, but less than book value. Uh, is he going to face capital gains? Well, if he sells stock, yeah, but not if he sells access, assets at that price. Well, you've just been telling me to do a stock deal. I mean, I've had to get down, and that's fine to do the nitty gritty, but I know we're kind of belaboring this, but you really have to push them. You have to say this. It's like you're talking to a five-year-old child. And you have to say it a zillion times. And maybe I should start using the strategy that works with children. I can get my, my sister has two kids. I can get these little kids to do anything by saying, I bet you can't. And then little kids will do anything to prove you wrong. Maybe I need to do that with the business owners. Yeah, i tell you what we, what we do, Bill. It, it, that's an interesting approach. What we do end up doing is, um, and is we, we actually have um, developed some expertise. I think that's one of the value adds. We're, we're not tax guys. But we know enough to ask the right questions. And 
So we we kind of what we do is take to the the tax guys uh, an, a preliminary analysis that we do and say, okay, shoot holes in this. Tell us what we've got wrong. Tell us, give us some ideas on how to improve this. And so they're responding to something instead of a blank sheet of paper. And that's that's one approach that will kind of uh, sometimes. Yeah, no, yeah. The, yeah. The, the other is, is that, and we find this quite a bit, is that many of the tax folks that um, company owners have um, as part of their team, they're, they're great tax and they're, they, they're good for an annual, they're annual, but they're not transaction tax folks. So we have, sure. we have folks that we can go to that, you know, we're simply asking our client for permission to spend a little bit of their money to to get somebody that knows transaction, you know, the, the taxation around the transactions and to weigh in on it, not to replace their accountant, but simply to give some very deal specific advice that um, that can help their accountant. You know, this is actually a great segue into our, our next question here. So, so Mark, this, this one will be for you, but, you know, how, how do you balance kind of competing interests of the buyers and the sellers during the negotiation process? Like even with the example of this tax, like, you know, each side has a, a certain way that they would want to do the deal because it would benefit them, um, you know, but but how do you find something that reaches kind of a mutually beneficial um, kind of uh, middle ground for both sides, if you can? And, and uh, you know, the, the one thing in your book was, you know, confidentiality and certainty. That, that's what everybody's trying to get out of a deal. Um, but may, maybe just hit on some of that, just the, you know, balancing the competing interests between buyer and seller. So part of it is my view of negotiation, which is it should be a mutual education and exploration process. And part of the reason why this last discussion was so important is you don't want to be sitting at a table and saying, I want stock, I want stock, I want stock, and just keep repeating it like you're one of his nephews or nieces. You want to say, I need it to be stock because you'd have to pay me $6 million more to do it any other way. So I can explore a different way, but the only way I end up the same way is pay me 10 or pay me 16. When you can explain to your counterparty why you have a need, then they tend to say, okay, that's a legitimate need. I'm going to have to address it in structuring. And so part of a negotiation of structure, going back to the why it's the three things you care about. Okay, I really believe you. Those are the three things. Let's see how close I can come to meeting your needs there. There is no middle ground. There are a lot of places where, okay, you're going to win the variable or you won't. Great. The real question is, do I have, I have enough variables that accomplish what I'm trying to accomplish that in the aggregate, I want to do the deal. And both counterparties should have multiple ways of accomplishing that. But you start by listening to what the other person needs and explaining what you need. And you can only do that to Bill and Ken's point is if you know who you are and what you need. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, great. Well, you, you have, you, 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 absolutely, sorry, yeah, you, you absolutely have to communicate when you're, you're selling. I mean, we buy companies too, and I'll tell the, the sellers, we've got a buy side client, they want to do a deal. And I say, I got to have something, you know, I, I can't read your mind. I, I can't, I can't write an offer that, cause I'm the guy that writes the LOI. I, I can't write an LOI that says whatever, you know, when you say, what do you want to do? Whatever. I mean, do you want to sell the whole thing? 80%? Do you want to have uh, a piece of stock? You know, what do you want? Uh, and you got to give us something to work on that we can negotiate out. And, and, and Mark, I agree with you. I, I made my notes here. It's, communication and explanation. You know, you can't pound the table and and demand that you're going to get the other side. You know, this whole stock thing, uh, what we say, if somebody needs to do a, a stock deal because of, of a tax situation, you offer, you know what, what you do is you throw the lawyer under the bus. Hey, we'll agree to extra stringent representations and, and, and uh, uh, representations and warranties. Let the lawyers hammer this stuff out to make sure that you've got your coverage. And by the way, if you buy assets, you probably don't have the protection that you think you do because anybody can sue anybody for any reason. Yeah, I, yeah. Think, I, I think if you Wait, come back to- If you can add on that. Yeah, I think if you come back to um, what, one technique for uh, trying to get through this efficiently is to know, as I think Mark was saying, you, you need to know what you, you what's preferential for you. So it really at the 
early onset of a sale process, sit down and figure out what's the ideal transaction. Um, I mean, we, we, we make it, we're not, it's not as simple as just stock versus asset. Um, there are many times where let, let's, you're selling a, a business that's an S corp, mostly a good, it's going to be mostly goodwill, a goodwill, and you're fine with selling the assets or doing a, a um, where there's almost little difference between a stock sale and yep. an asset sale. Yep. So you may not really care on that point. But there may be other points that really make an, a, a real difference to you. So I think by understanding the nuances here, because there's a lot of nuance, a lot of detail around this, um, uh, you, you can you can know in advance where you can give and where you need you really need to hold your ground. Um, so I think it comes back to that preparation, making sure you've done your homework and you know what you're when you go to market, so you can act efficiently and you can be you can act quickly. Yeah, I mean yeah. there is you know, sort of flexibility. Ricky? No, I was going to say, Kenny, I, I totally agree just with that, 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 that tax issue and why having your tax people actually do it instead of the yeah, yeah, yes, because the reflexive answer might be stock deal and they actually crunch the numbers. Maybe an asset deal is better or maybe it's a de minimis difference. And so, yeah, I to totally agree with your point. I'm sorry, guys. Go on. Mark, Mark, I'll, I'll get the, you the to make a point. The only quick thing I wanted to say is the reason I said identify the three or four things you really care about on day one. Yeah is 30 days later, ask yourself the same question. And it's frequently not the same three or four things. You know, I thought I was buying the world's greatest factory. You know what? It's actually the EVP who runs the factory. Doesn't matter what the factory is. It's a person I'm trying to get. Or um, it's now 60 days later and you, everybody knows a lot more. And you go back and you say, you know, in the beginning, I was really worried about this because but now that I actually understand the business, where the real risk is, here's what I really need to protect myself against. And it's like everything else in the deal world. You, you can't ever start that you assume you know what's going on. You have to question and re-question and re-question and re-question and re-question. Yeah, great. Uh, great comments there. Uh, so before I move on, I just want to remind everybody, if you guys have questions for the last 10 minutes, uh, at the top of the hour, we're going to take some questions here. So um, please put them in the Q&A box. Kenneth, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll keep on with you here and ask uh, the next question on our agenda to, to you. So what role do advisors such as investment bankers and lawyers play in the deal structuring process? Uh, and how do they help ensure the successful outcome? Uh, Bill's already mentioned that uh, you know shouldn't have lawyers negotiating, uh, but what what is your what are your thoughts on on like you know the roles of advisors on negotiating and um, you know other aspects of, of deal structuring? Well, part of it part of it depends on um, the capability or the experience and the skills of that advisor. So if if you've if you've got a a well informed advisor that really understands the deal holistically and isn't just the kind of the the, the finder of the deal and then is trying to hand it off. Um, it, that advisor can really pull together and uh, by understanding the objectives at multiple levels of the seller or the buyer in that case. And, and then effectively, um, I, I, this gets overused, but quarterback the deal and quarterback uh, making sure that those priorities, those top three or four or five that Mark was talking about get built in. And I, and I think part of it is being, being well-informed and being able to craft that strategy and have some vision into what that, that uh, structure should be as the conversation gets closer to, um, to that LOI. So it's, it, it's about asking a lot of questions, about having knowledge around, the, the, you know, around legal tax and the economics of the deal, and then being able to bring the expertise, the, the whether it's tax or legal, um, to the table to be able to make sure you you get all the pieces together. I hope that wasn't too um, you know too too conceptual, but um, it, it does make a difference. And you want to lead the advisor. One of the things in negotiating the the deal is, where for example, Mark was talking about knowing what's important to you. I think part of it is also being able to voice that 
if you're running, for example, most of the time we run a limited auction. And so we're, we're letting the buyers know up front in a sale process what those critical elements are up front. So if, if I've got, uh, let me give you an example. If, if I've got a, a company that's a C Corp that's been around a while and is likely can take advantage of the uh, uh, 1202 exemption, that's the, that's the small qualified business. If, 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 I, if I've got a client like that and so I need a stock sale, and 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 I and I and I really need it for that reason. I'm going to voice that up front so the buyers that want to be competitive in the process know that's a critical box to check for me. Um, and so I think a good advisor can lead the, the structuring piece by leading with you know the, the what do I have to have in the process. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I find that outlining kind of the objectives out front is. Important. Uh, just to, to stage what the structuring is going to look like and, and right. to, to navigate to where it's going to go or where you want it to go. Um, Bill, can, can you add to that? What, what are your thoughts yeah. around the goals? Sure, that? sure. Yeah, the uh, some commentary around for, that. for me, and I, I agree with what Ken and Mark have been saying, being creative, quick-witted, and having guts because that's what negotiating is. And, and the key thing for me whenever I think about negotiating is I think about playing poker. And everybody thinks, oh, poker, bluffing. Nah, it's not bluffing. You're going to get creamed if you try and bluff. The key skill is reading the other side, reading your hand and then reading the other side and knowing how to play your hand. And if you have a strong hand compared to the other side, that's great. But if you overplay that strong hand, you chase everybody away. It's like playing cards and you get dealt – four aces right off the bat and you bet like crazy, what's everybody going to do? They're going to fold. Congratulations. You won the ante. And if you have a weak hand, well, how, how do I best play this and get out of this uh, scenario? I had a, a former colleague and he, he had a, he told me that years ago he had, he had a client who called him the caveman. I said, why do they call you the caveman? And he said, well, I don't like to negotiate. And every time the negotiation got difficult, the client said, you caved man. So they call them the caveman. So you've got to have some some guts, know what you're doing, quick witted, and be very creative. You, you know, just to, I, I, I I didn't give Mark a chance to jump in, but it, you know what gives you the 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 leverage to be bold is options. And how do you get options? You have competition at the table. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah, Mark, competition Mark, or the sem or the semblance of competition or the semblance of competition. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. Bill. I totally agree. Yeah. 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 Mark, Mark, can we uh, get your thoughts on uh, this, this idea of the role of the advisor? Yes, but I'm going to start with where Ken and Bill just ended first. Yep. So 1202 may be the most underappreciated and simply unknown provision in buying and selling businesses. And in 10 seconds or less, it simply means if you bought C Corp stock, and it jumped through five hoops. It never had more than 50 million in assets. It's an operating company. You didn't sell your stock, blah, 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 blah. You go to sell it, you sell the stock, you pay zero capital gains, zero. It's a very good number, zero. And what I would tell you from experience is at least 85% of accountants and lawyers have never even heard, even never even heard of 1202. So it's a particularly good example. The shorthand way that I think about everything we've been saying is in both of their books, which I actually read, they made the point that for most founders and entrepreneurs and middle market companies, they're going to sell one company one time in their lifetime. It's the most important event and they're the least equipped yep. for it. So if yep. you're a novice, would you ever want another novice advising you? That's a rhetorical question. <laughs> so that's kind of wraps up what everybody's just been saying. You want a team that complements your strengths and acknowledges your weaknesses, which also means we come back to you have to know who you are and not think you're the sim simply the smartest girl in the room because you're usually not. Well, those, those are great points. The, the just last thought there, the negotiating, I'll, give something away and these guys can take notes and everybody's going to steal this is what I tell prospective clients. 
a lot of things that we do are, are highly important, the materials and research and all that kind of stuff. But the ability of your, of your investment banker to negotiate a transaction is by far the most important. Well, how do we determine how someone's a good negotiator? Very simple. You ask for a fee agreement, cut it to the bone and say, I'm prepared to work on this basis. And if that investment banker accepts your low ball offer, don't hire them. The way they negotiate with you is how they would negotiate for you. You have to keep that in mind. And if somebody is a caveman and they fold like crazy, that you might not want to work with that person. Bill, one other one other adage that could go with that is, um, is it that your strongest negotiating leverage is the ability to walk away, and and that's Absolutely. just the ability to say no. And I think that you you'll find that by sellers not getting so tied or buyers getting so tied to a deal and and knowing what they need and what they want and what they're willing to do and what the value of their their uh, business is um th that ability to walk away from the table put pens down that's that's very powerful and yep yeah and that uh, by the way is something that, where the guy that doesn't have yeah, good go on, advisors Mark. actually made a difference they say hey when we started this deal mary you said the first three points were one, two, and three. None of those are in this agreement. Do you actually still want to do this deal? And hold up a mirror and help the person see themselves. And in a super emotional set of circumstances, help them strip the emotion away and let their analytical framework come out. Yeah, Mark, you make a really great point there because I find that you know the advisor and, and should be the leaders of negotiating the transaction. But ultimately, it comes to the buyer and seller, the people that are writing the check and receiving the check that need to make the ultimate decision. Um, so it's it's like coaching them. It's, it's uh, you know, it, it's really kind of bringing to light what the circumstances of the situation are uh, that's important. Do you agree with that? I, I think everybody on this phone would tell you that half of their job is they're a psychotherapist. Because that's true. Any side of this is an emotional roller coaster of fear, greed, the world's falling, you know, I'm selling too soon, I'm selling too late. Why am I doing this? Who will I be tomorrow? I mean, it it is yeah. gut wrenching, particularly on the yeah. sell side, not the buy side, but on the sell side, somebody sells their business, they don't know where they go tomorrow, they don't know what their title is, they don't know how to introduce themselves. They don't know what, what are they going to say? They just, it's, if you took your iPhone, which all of us have, and you remove one of the apps on the front page, everything else moves around, right? And you can't really find what you want because it's moved around. Pretend that's your life. <laughs> Somebody moved the app. Where's my home screen? <laughs> Well, I tell you, Mark, you're, you're, you're making a great point that one, one of the things we start with, and we've done this more and more over the last five or six years, is we, we want to know who they're, uh, do they have a wealth manager or a financial planner? And we want them to be part of the team and part of the process and meet with them so that we're able to get some clarity around what are the real goals and objectives here, not just for the deal, but how does this fit into your future plans? And it enables us to kind of move that conversation further along if it if it hasn't happened. And it gives the ability to start, you know, asking those questions about what this is going to look like post-closing so that they don't get to the, you know, they don't get that super anxious seller's remorse, you know, towards the end. Um, yeah. We also we also we we also have this adage, I'm sorry for all these little one-liners, but we also have this adage we tell clients up front, listen, this thing is going to die three times before we get it done. And don't, don't, you know, just take a deep breath. Let us do our job. Let us push and, and we'll, and we'll get this done. And it's so funny because we'll, when it does invariably happen, instead of freaking out, they come and say, well, is this number one? You know? <laughs> yeah. And clients remember that stuff. And it, it's great. Bill, Bill let's, uh, yeah, let's the, here a little, yeah, little bit. You go ahead. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what, what advice do you have for dealing with? We've been talking about, you know, kind of uh, advising some of the sellers, but what do you have, what advice do you have for deal makers? I know we probably have a lot of deal makers 
um, listening in here. So what, what advice would you have for them who want to kind of improve their skills in the area of deal structuring? Obviously, one, one of the things that we've been pushing is, you know, read, read uh, the books from these three amazing, not only authors, but deal makers. So, but what other advice do you have for people to improve their skills on just, um, you know, being better transaction uh, doers or executors? Well, to do this work, you need a couple skills. You need to be an expert in accounting. You need to have strong math skills. You need to know how to write. Those are the basics. And then beyond that, you have to figure out where you fit in. If you want to be a deal maker, are you going to be the one who negotiates? Well, are you a passive type person? Do you get nervous when you're asking for Because a lot of people do. They don't like to negotiate. They think it's pounding the table. They think it's make it you know, take, you know, take it or leave it type of stuff. And that's not how you get things done. So you have to understand uh, who you are and what your personality is. And the best way for me, uh, I'm the biggest hypocrite here. I've written business books. I've, I don't like to read them. I like to do stuff. And then I write up and that's how I learn. But that, that's what I encourage people. Go out and do it. Understand business and understand what you're good at. I, I've talked with people want to get into this line of work. And I always say, what's wrong with you? Did you fall down some stairs this morning? And they don't understand the different uh, silos of work, finding the client, preparing the materials, executing the transaction. They don't understand this. They don't know where they fit in. And so if you want to be a deal maker, well, what does that mean? Do you want to, do you want to be the one that most people want to analyze everything? They want to be an analyst. They spend all day behind the spreadsheet. They sound like an accountant. You know, how do people become an accountant? You know how they, this happens? They go off to college and they ask somebody, what kind of job can I get where I don't have to talk to people? And they become an accountant. So where do you, do you like to talk to people? Do you want to get out there and play golf? I've gotten clients playing golf, just a random thing, not looking for a client. And that led to a couple deals, you know, so where do you fit in and what do you like to do? I hate the, I hate doing research and I hate doing all the, the materials prep. I want to negotiate these things and go find the transactions. You got to figure out where you fit in and what your skills are. What are you good at? More importantly, what are you bad at? Most people cannot answer the question of what they're bad at. And, yeah, and by the way, understand that. that a deal maker is in a context. Bill might be the perfect deal maker for client A, and be a terrible deal maker for client B, because they're different people. And the same is true. I'm I am good in many circumstances, and I'm world class bad in a lot of other circumstances. And that's part of the rigorous actually knowing who you are, and where your boundaries are, and acknowledging that everybody's greatest strength is always their greatest weakness. That's a good point because I do I do find that you know, there's just some chemistry that you have with some people where it just clicks and and uh, you do really uh, you, you deliver a lot of you know a lot of value in that but like you said in other situations you're a world uh, world class failure so <laughs> that's uh, that's an interesting way to look at it uh, Kenneth you want to add to that you know what what are some skills what are you know, some resources uh, outside of your guys' books what are some things yeah. that people can do better deal with? I, I think one is, one is is the ability to listen, ask good questions and listen, and um, and then being a, being a problem solver is um, I, I just think it, it's kind of core to this. You know, if you think about putting a deal together, it's a complex puzzle. Yeah. There's all kinds of issues, and I think having good problem solving skills and being persistent uh, that 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 concept of persistence is just so critical. Um, I, it's amazing. We talk, my partner and I, I'm a business partner, and I talk about this all the time. Is you, you might may think a deal is dead, or you may just find an impasse, and and being persistent in continuing to um, look for the options, try to figure out and and listen for what are right, what's really critical here, and how can we solve this. Uh, most of the time, there's a solution if you can, if you, you know, if you can get around the problem enough. Yeah, it's, for sure. It's being a it's it's, it's being a buffer. Uh, Ken is a big part of our job. We we had a deal where uh, we're getting close to closing, a couple days away, and the client calls me up, and he's a great guy. But he's he was definitely a very emotional, hot headed guy. He'd be the first to tell you that. And he says we had to buy some new ball bearings for a machine. We have a new supplier. The old supplier went out of business. We used to buy them two at a time. Now they made us buy twenty, and uh, now we've got these extra eighteen that we don't need. And and I want the buyer to to buy them. And if they refuse, forget it. I'm going to blow up the whole deal. And he was going to blow it up over that. And that's that was his approach: take it or leave it. 
And he said, I understand that the expenses are, you know, before mine, but I don't want to pay this. So I called up the buyer and I explained the situation. Look, they've got 20 ball bearings, only need two. You're going to need these eventually. Okay, right. they're either going to sell them or if you want to buy them, then just help us out. You're going to need these anyway. You're going to need these over the next year or two. And the client agreed or the, the buyer agreed to buy them. So instead of doing the demand it and pounding the table, let's talk about it. Let's explain the situation and come up with a solution. Yep. Awesome. Okay, we got 10 minutes left here. Um, you know, a few people have asked for some stories. So, so Mark, maybe we'll start with you. Just provide some, some, you know, uh, some of your stories and your podcast uh, stories, and that's why I love it so much. But uh, just examples of creative deal structures that you've used. Uh, maybe some more stories around things that went, worked really well versus things that, that maybe haven't worked so well. So, so maybe if you can just give us an example of uh, the story around a deal structure. Um, that might be intriguing to our audience here. Okay, and and let me sort of start by observing anybody in the deal world who tells you they've only had successes is either drunk or lying. So <laughs> <laughs> lots of things haven't worked. I'll tell you the one that I've simply never seen anyone else do what I did and it worked. We were in a one of either Ken or Bill said that they were in an informal auction process pretty frequently. And there was an informal auction process of a distressed business. I'll just let it go at that. And it was going no place because the potential buyers were all strategics. So everybody looking at it was looking at it exactly the same way, knew the data, knew the customers, knew the receivables, nothing to distinguish them. And the intermediary all they were doing was saying, give me another purchase price bid. Give me another purchase price bid. Submit a two-page letter of intent. Time drifts on. Distressed businesses get more distressed pretty quickly. And so I, I asked the CEO one day, hey, we've been doing this dance for 60 days. You know, do you still want to buy this? I mean, I'm, I'm always questioning the assumptions. And essentially he said, well, if we buy it in the next two or three weeks, yes. Otherwise, let it collapse and I'll just pick off the pieces. Okay. So how would we distinguish ourselves? And I came back a day later and said, I have a completely insane idea. I'll laugh at me before you laugh at me. But here's the idea. Every seller wants certainty, 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 and certainty. That doesn't exist here. So here's my crazy idea. Let's draft the 60 page acquisition agreement. Let's draft all the employment contracts, all the non competition agreements, the release we need from the bank, the opinion letter we need from the lawyer. I wanted to send them every single piece of paper we would need to close the deal. Here's our price. And what we've now done is we're the only people who provide you certainty. We don't need, we, we, um, we don't need to set up a new loan. Right? We can get the cash from our bank. We have the thing. You don't have to guess what reps and warranties we want. You can read them. You don't have to guess how we want to employ you. You can read them. You don't have to guess at anything. Every single thing, if you guys sign this paper tomorrow, we'll close the next day. And we said, here's the deal. We're sending you the stuff. We'll come to your city. We'll stay there one day. It's either yes or no. We have a plane to catch. We'll be on that plane. An hour and a half before then, we're walking out of your office. Yes or no? And the answer is no. We'll part as friends. And if it's yes, we'll close in 10 days. They hated that. <laughs> they, they like this, but I didn't want to play that game anymore. And that's the only time I've ever done that. And I'm not even sure why I did that. But it's, it's sort of the ultimate in how do you demonstrate certainty instead of just talking about certainty. And my client essentially said, I, what I said to him was, if this works, I'm a genius and you'll kiss me on all four cheeks. If it doesn't work, you'll tell me the stupidest person you ever met. I'm okay with that. It worked. It there worked. Were no kisses, by the way. <laughs> Great job. I love it. Yeah, you had that, uh, you had that story in your book. 
uh, was listening to it yesterday. And I, I also love the way you kind of negotiate the purchase price in that, but uh, we'll, we'll foreshadow <laughs> so everybody can go out and buy, uh, and buy Mark's book and, and listen to that story uh, or read the story. Uh, Kenneth, maybe give us your uh, war story because everybody that's uh, a deal maker loves to hear war stories and loves to hear. Uh, yeah, my, and listen, I'm not near as good at this as Mark is, but I, I, I can, it, one thing to, this is less of a story and it, it, it's about a real deal, but the thing that the thing that I keep in mind is, is, you know, as you get into middle market businesses, a lot of times there is real estate and, um, you know, there are some real estate, doing a deal on the real estate can be um, really advantageous from a tax standpoint. It could be uh, ways to, um, you, you know, you can, you can definitely vary purchase price uh, on both the real estate and the business to some degree. Yeah, and so what I, I what we've done before is where there um, is provide some um, creative um, balancing of purchase price between real estate and between operations, um, and where there's been a, a lack of um, or where there's been some uncertainty. Sometimes we even if there's intellectual property involved. Um, you know, you can carve the intellectual property out and do a license for the IP with a right to buy it eventually, which kind of can protect in an, in, a, in an uncertain environment. And so I think it's it's not thinking about things in a in a traditional linear manner. It comes back to this idea of creative problem solving. Um, what are you really dealing with? And it's, um, so I, I know that wasn't quite a story, but I. I encourage folks to think about the different elements of value within a transaction and how you can um, you, how you can look at those to solve the both parties objectives yeah that's great perspective uh, bill let, uh, one one uh, sure. last, last kind of formal part and then we'll uh, get into some questions here real quickly at the end but what's uh, give us a story around um, you know a deal that you've had to use some creative deal structuring yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you one of the one of the bad ones. That we were selling a company, and we had multiple offers. Very, very profitable company, and we were getting offers largely all cash, mostly all cash in the mid twenties. And we had one outlier that had a thirty two, thirty three million dollar valuation. Hey, that sounds pretty great. Let's do the thirty two, thirty three. Well, what was going on? The lower offers were twenty two million dollars cash at close and a two million dollar note, something like that. Basically, all cash. This other deal ended up being two million dollars in cash, some stock in a Canadian uh, penny stock on your Toronto Venture Exchange. I don't know if they were throwing any uh, back bacon in there as well. And then a note, a gigantic note. I can't remember the exact amount, but it was twenty seven million, twenty nine million. So it was ridiculous. And I said, don't do this deal. What, what, what about the you know twenty two million in cash and a two million dollar note? And the lawyer is saying, don't do the deal. Well, the guys, the owners of the company, wanted to do the crazy deal. And you can guess what happened. It's been a disaster for them, I hate to say. In fact, I, I tried to encourage them to foreclose because they were being renegotiated. And instead of getting their interest payments, they were getting more worthless stock in the Canadian uh, back banking company up there on the Toronto Venture Exchange, and which is kind of the, their, their version, your, your version of uh, uh, penny stocks, except they have a funny accent. Um, so it's been a, it's been a disaster. I mean, what is wrong with substantially all cash at close? They wanted to go shoot for the moon with all the stock, which is still worthless, and it, it's been a disaster. I'm, I'm a big fan of cash, all or mostly cash at close. Yeah, yeah, definitely increases the certainty. That that bat, bat, back bacon is pretty good though. So uh, <laughs> yeah, no, and listen, if if they would have gotten back bacon out of the damn deal, it would have been a good deal. We got nothing out of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Those, those are awesome story, guys. Uh, so we'll we'll take one real quick question here, um, and then we will wrap it up. But uh, you know, some people are talking about uh, just negotiating working capital, and I know that's a uh, you know complex um, and and often discussed and and you know debated topic within deal structuring. But maybe we could start with you, Kenneth, uh, just talking about working capital and and um, quickly understanding that and how to how to structure. Uh, uh, that and, and then leaving a minute is not fair, but uh, yeah. It's, uh, well, I, I tell you what, the, there's there's a, there's a number of different ways to 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 look at um, ne negotiating working capital. And what I would say is, if I'm on the sell side, I want to set out the principles for negotiating that working capital in my LOI, so that, that be, um, so that I don't get taken advantage of post signing or after signing the LOI. 
And um, it, because it depends on the business, depends on all, it's not one of those things you can answer, or at least I, I, I can't get it down into a minute. But I think getting getting some parameters around that is is really important in the in the LOI. Buyers won't like that, um, but th from a seller's perspective, it's it's helpful. Yeah, for sure. Hey guys, we're up against the hour here. I want to keep it at on time. Um, everybody, go out and get these um, the books from these three amazing individuals, three amazing deal makers. Uh, three authors. Guys, thank you so much for joining me today. And I'm, I'm super grateful that you were able to spend, uh, you know, an hour with me and our audience. Um, if anybody wants to get a hold of you guys, LinkedIn, is that okay if they reach out to you guys there? Sure. LinkedIn is fine. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Awesome, guys. Thank you again. You know, just given the interest, we'll probably have to do it again. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, John. Yeah, thanks, John. Take care, thanks everybody. all. <laughs>